You're listening to Talking Freely, where we discuss culture, politics, and religious freedom. Talking Freely is a podcast from Freedom for Faith, a Christian legal think tank that exists to protect and promote religious freedom in Australia. Welcome to Talking Freely. My name is Rowan McHugh. With me today is Carl Truman, who is Professor of Biblical and Religious Studies at Grove City College. He is a church historian and previously served as the William E. Simon Fellow in Religion and Public Life at Princeton University. Professor Truman has authored or edited more than a dozen books and has just released a book entitled The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Cultural Amnesia, Expressive Individualism and the Road to Sexual Revolution, which is the topic of our discussion today. Professor Truman, welcome to Talking Freely. It's great to be here, Rowan. Thanks for having me on. One of the cultural pathologies you mention in your book is the tendency towards a forgetfulness of the past and the effect of the past on the present. A major turning point was the consideration of nature as something for humans to exert their will upon rather than something that could educate and give order to existence. What were the drivers for this and what are the ramifications for us today? Well, it's a, it's a huge question, uh, and there are numerous sort of influences or forces at work behind that, that, that idea that nature is something for us to, to overcome. Uh, I mean, part, I think we have to say, even as Protestants, the Reformation plays some role in that because the Reformation helped remove the, the sacramental dimension of nature that's very important to Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and made, you know, to put it in sort of simplistic layman's terms, made, made nature less mysterious uh, than it once was and, and tended to see nature not so much as something that reflected the very being of God, but as something that was rather arbitrarily related to him. So there's a, there's a religious side to that story. I think there's also a dimension of, uh, was a technological dimension. Uh, the rise of technology has encouraged us to think that we can overcome nature. And that's not an entirely bad thing, of course. Uh, we live uh, in, in an era where uh, irrigation, uh, understanding of, of how to grow crops. Uh, we're talking to each other by Skype. We use telephones. We use computers. There are lots and lots of good things that have come up from technology. I've just had a, a dental implant. Would not have wanted to have a dental implant before they discovered how to freeze my jaw and do it. It would have been a most unpleasant exercise. But all of these things give us a feeling of power, that we have a, a sense of control over nature, that nature is something that we can bend to our will. And then a third component would be the the transformation in the understanding of of the self. Um, The sense I use the self, the word self in the book, is, is not in the common sense way that, you know, I know I'm not Rowan McHugh and you know you're not Carl Truman. We have a a basic self-consciousness of our individuality. But the idea of uh, of what it is that really makes me me, where my identity lies. And today we have a, a highly psychologized understanding of our identity. It's really that inner voice that tells us who we are. Now, you might say, well, what does that have to do with our attitude to the world around us. Well, it really makes the world around us something of a problem (laughs) because if I am who I am, if I am at my best, at my most authentic inside, then everything that impinges on that becomes a potential means of making me less authentic. And so the very notion of the self sets up this this relationship with, with nature out there, that nature is something that that I need to bring in conformity with my, to my inner voice. It's not something that I need to locate myself within. So this, this idea of nature as something that we need to overcome or something we can manipulate, it has, if you like, philosophical, metaphysical, religious roots. Uh, it has technological roots. And it also has, I think, uh, roots in, in the notion of selfhood. In your book, you draw heavily on the thinker Philip Reef. For the uninitiated, could you touch on the importance he places on the sacred and how his work predicted our culture of therapeutic well-being? 
Yes, well, Philip Reef is an interesting character. For those of you who are interested in, in feminist literature, he was at one time married to Susan Sontag, who was probably one of the most important American uh, feminist intellectuals of the last uh, 50 years. He spent most of his career as the professor of sociology at the University of Pennsylvania, but he was also the, the editor of the American edition of the works of Sigmund Freud. He was very influenced by Freud. And... Reef used some Freudian concepts to analyze culture. Now, I, I know a lot of Christians in the audience will sort of recoil at that and think, oh, Freud's a bad guy. But actually, Freud has some interesting and, and helpful things to say, and, and Reef picked up on them. And, and one of them was, was Freud's insight that the moral codes that, that preserve society uh, have been traditionally grounded in, uh, in religion. You know, religion exists for Freud in large part to, to provide a kind of background or foundation for the moral principles by which we govern our corporate social life. And Reef picked up on this, and, and Reef's, uh, Reef's study of society led him to believe that really prior to the present day, all societies had organized their social order we might say they, their earthly way of going about their business, of deciding what is right and wrong, with reference to a sacred order. They justify their morality, if you like, by reference to something beyond themselves. You could look at ancient Sparta. In ancient Sparta, the first king, Lycurgus, had uh, received, the legend uh, claimed that he had he'd received the Spartan law code from the oracle at Delphi. So you could imagine a scene in a Spartan household where a teenage boy is misbehaving and his father tells him you can't do that and the teenage boy says why can't I do that and the father says because it's written in the law and the law was given to Lycurgus from the gods by the oracle at Delphi so the father is there appealing to a sacred order to justify the contemporary social order same thing in 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 the broadly Christian West, if you like, uh, during the Middle Ages and, and the Reformation, right, really right down up until the Enlightenment. Uh, social codes, social moral codes were grounded in the idea that God had revealed himself. He'd revealed his character in nature and in uh, the pages of the Bible. Uh, and therefore, uh, human law was to be patterned after the divine character as revealed in these things. In other words, there is a social order based upon a sacred order. The medieval peasant son rebels against his parents, and his parents say, you can't do that. And he says, why can't I do that? And he says, because, because it's against the laws, and our laws reflect the character of God. So actually, you're defying God. Social order based on sacred order. What Reef says is interesting about the contemporary world is that we've got rid of sacred order. In other words, we have nothing beyond the contemporary moment or the contemporary structure of society by which to justify that moral structure of society. So if you like that same scenario, kid rebelling against their parents uh, and the parents say, you can't do that. And the, and the child turns around and say, why can't I do that? The parents, if you like, are left with having to say, because we say you can't do that, or because it's never been done that way before, neither of which are particularly strong arguments. Extrapolate that to culture as a whole, and that's the moment in which we find ourselves. Every country on the face of the earth has a moral structure. But in Australia, in the United States, in Great Britain, there's no longer uh, any conception of a sacred order by which to justify that moral order, which makes the moral order very unstable. And Reef's uh, view of that was, this is why we will see increasing instability, moral instability within our societies, because we really have nothing beyond ourselves by which to justify ourselves. And no society has ever successfully justified itself purely on the basis of itself ever before in history. Until the time of the Enlightenment, Western civilization was animated by an Augustinian view of sinful tendencies, which was challenged by the thinker Rousseau. Could you walk us through the impact of Rousseau's thought and why it was the beginning of a mindset that resonates today? Yeah, Rousseau is, is singularly important. He's not the only guy thinking his kind of thoughts in the 18th century, but he's, he's beautifully representative and, and very influential in a certain strand of, of thinking. Rousseau's idea was uh, 
it's not society that improves you. It's society that messes you up. That, you know, his, his famous catchphrase uh, is uh, from his discourse on, on inequality is, oh, sorry, from his social contract is man is born free and everywhere is in chains. The idea was that man born and left alone by the constrictions, the expectations of society would be a spontaneously authentic and moral person. The problem comes when we find ourselves in social settings and envy kicks in and competition kicks in and ambition kicks in and society's ills come from the social structure uh, of the world around us, if you like. And therefore, the, the key to being an authentic human being and the language of authenticity really sort of comes in in this Rousseau strain of thinking. The key to being an authentic human being is not to find one's place in society. You know, you're born in the Middle Ages, you're growing up, what are you going to do? You're going to find out what your allotted role in society is, learn to play that role and play it. You know, you're born to a peasant family or you're born to a noble family. You're going to grow up to be a peasant. You're going to grow up to be a noble. You have to learn the role and, and do it. That's how you become you. Rousseau says, no, the way to become authentically you is to get in touch with that untainted voice of nature within you. The real you is not the you that society tells you you are. It's not the, the real you that society forces you to be. The real you is who you feel you are inside. And you know, the, if you think it doesn't, it doesn't take much to, to jump forward to say the interview that uh, Bruce, now Caitlin Jenner, had with Diane Sawyer in round about 2015 when, when Bruce transitioned to become Caitlin. The interview he did with Diane Sawyer was all about how he'd lived a lie. He'd had to perform a role that society had imposed upon him. And finally, he was now free to be the person he always had been. That's quintessential Rousseau kind of thinking, that the real you, the real me, the real Bruce, was actually that voice within. And society had done nothing but sort of constrict and prevent him from fully being authentic. So that's the kind of Rousseau stream. As I say, he's not the only person having these ideas in the, uh, uh, the 18th century, but he is perhaps the most influential articulator of them. What I found so helpful about this book is that it goes beyond a mere contrast of ideas in that you crucially provide reasons why a cultural shift has occurred. And some of the ways you do this is through the notion of death works in poetry and the arts and a forgetfulness of history. Can you take us through these examples and others and how they've gradually pushed us away from the sacred? Sure. Uh, death works is, uh, is one of the very useful concepts developed by Philip Reef, to whom we, we referred uh, a few moments ago. Uh, Philip Reef is, is interested in, in what elites do in this new culture that's emerging. Uh, the elites for Philip Reaver, the politicians, the teachers, the intellectuals, the artists, the people who, who shape the way society thinks and behaves. And I should also add that when Reef talks about culture, he's using culture in a very specific way. For Reef, culture is the way in which values are passed down from generation to generation. Culture is the way, if you like, civilization reproduces itself. And typically, historically, elites have played a, a very significant role in that. The, the, the role of the elite has been to transmit the wisdom of the past to the present. Not necessarily in an untransformed form, obviously things change over time, but the elites exhibited a respect for the past that meant their task was essentially to, to bring the wisdom of that past to bear on the present, to transmit it to the present. Reef says, once you abandon the notion of sacred order, a couple of things kick in. First of all, a rather anti-historical tendency kicks in. And this goes to the second point you raise. Because when you look back on the cultures of the past, you inevitably see them as oppressive because they were essentially pressing on the world fictional sacred orders that did nothing but 
repress and distort people's sense of self. So part of the task, the task of the, of the elite then, becomes dismantling that past. Well, then the question is, how do they do it? Well, Reef says one of the key ways that the elites do this is through death works. They take the, the idioms of the past and they make them ridiculous or they make them obscene or they make them thoroughly unpleasant and implausible. And the example I use in the book is of the, the piece of artwork by the uh, uh, artist Andres Serrano, who produced this work some decades ago now uh, with, the, with the rather crude title, uh, Piss Christ. And the artwork was, was, was a photograph of a, a crucifix submerged in a bottle of Serrano's own urine. And Reef would say that's a classic death work because what Serrano's doing there is he's taking something that the previous culture considered to be sacred and important and something that grounded the values, the morality of that culture, and he's making it simultaneously, one might say, both obscene and ridiculous. And Reef has this interesting turn of phrase. He says that Serrano has taken the sacramental there and made it excremental. Now, that's a rather extreme and, and obvious example of a death work. But Reef would, would say you can see these death works all around you. Anything that takes something that the previous culture considered valuable and important and makes it ridiculous is a death work. Think of how many soap operas and movies have been made poking fun at old age, poking fun at families, making families appear like units of oppression, making old people look like uh, stick in the mud, ignorant bigots compared to the, uh, the fresh-faced, open-minded, beautiful young people. Reef would say that's, that's a death work. Death work in, in, in there in service of that kind of Brousseau notion of identity. Here, the means by which culture forms the individual, the means of education, are being made ridiculous, being destroyed by being presented through these artifacts of culture in an inherently oppressive, unpleasant, one might say even immoral way. So death works are uh, uh, very important. And of course, play to how we all think. You know, most people don't hold the views they hold on, say, gay marriage, or homosexuality, uh, because they've heard really good arguments in favor or against these things. Most people hold their views on those things through intuitions that have been shaped by the artifacts of culture, tastes that have been shaped by the works or the death works of the culture around us. So death works, very important and tie into that anti-historical tendency that Reef identifies as one of the, the basic pathologies of modern culture. When we refer to our age as one of self-directed indulgence, it can feel like a cliched comment, like calling millennials the me generation. You go beyond this by also examining the human craving for recognition and belonging. Can you elaborate on this and why it helps us to understand our culture beyond mere individualism? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. And I'll come at it from a, from a couple of directions. First of all, I think that there are two basic drives, it seems to me, in all human beings. We want to be free. And we have an intuitive sense of our own freedom. You know, I've chosen to be on this program with you. I experience life not as a, a marionette being manipulated by, by some giant puppet master. I intuitively feel that I'm free. And, and I like that. We all like to feel free. We don't like to feel that we're being forced to do things we don't want to do. On the other hand, we we also want to belong. We, we want others to recognize us as having value and importance. We want to be part of a team. Everybody or, or many of us have had that experience of, of wanting to be part of a group that has not allowed us to belong. And it, it alienates you. It hurts you. It, it, it makes you feel bad. So that's the sort of the basic idea behind that, that human beings, we want to be free, but we also want to belong. And that was part of, of what was in the back of my mind. I was trying to work out, you know, a simple question. Why is it that teenagers will all tell you that their clothes 
are an expression of who they are inside. If any kind of Rousseau idea, my clothes are an expression of me, of who I am. That free individualism, if you like, but they all look the same. They all dress the same. And there you go to that. Well, they, they dress that way because not only do they want to express themselves, they want to express themselves in a way that is acknowledged by others in a way that is seen as valuable by the group with which they want to identify. So freedom and belonging is, is very, very important. And I think that has implications for how we understand the sexual revolution because society itself has codes by which we're allowed to express our freedom, but we're also allowed to belong. Take an extreme example. You know, if expressing myself involved killing people, on the streets of Grove City or the streets of Sydney, uh, I could certainly express my freedom that way, but society would not allow me to belong. It would not recognize that as a legitimate way of expressing myself, would lock me up. Uh, would get me out of the way of, of society. That's an extreme example. But it points to the fact that society has a, a certain structure, a certain membership code, if you like, by which we can belong. And this uh, I found very helpful in trying to work out why is it that sexual identity is not simply something that we, we tolerate these days, but we have to affirm. There was a time maybe 20 or 15 years ago where a lot of Christians thought that, you know, tolerating homosexuality would be uh, a, a sort of a reasonable compromise, if you like. I, I, we, don't, we don't want to put homosexuals in prison, uh, but we don't want to, 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 to give them sort of full marriage rights, for example. And many Christians thought that would be a reasonable compromise, but of course it isn't because sexual behavior, sexual identity is now a code by which people belong to society. And if you say to a gay person, I tolerate your gayness, but I do not approve of it, what you're actually saying to that person is, I will tolerate your gayness, but don't make the mistake of thinking that you truly belong. I'm really pushing you to the margins. It's a little bit like in the American South in the 1950s uh, with uh, African-Americans. You know, we'll tolerate African-Americans in, in, in the restaurants, but they got to sit over there. They can only use that restroom. That's toleration. And we see there that that's toleration with, which, which doesn't have any true recognition in it. And we see that as, as something that is clearly going to be harmful or upsetting to the person. And that's how sexual politics is playing out today. Often Christians think about sexual issues in terms of behavior. It's actually much more a matter of belonging, freedom and belonging, which makes it a much more politically tricky issue to address. Although there's an element of chaos in the departure from sacred things, the pursuit of authenticity and liberation has taken a specific shape with specific challenges to the social order and our intuitions. Why is it that some forms of expressiveness have become dominant and some have not? Again, very good question. Uh, I mean, clearly we, we might say that the two forms of, uh, of expressivism that are, that are very dominant and very politically potent at the moment are sexual identity and, and racial identity. Uh, I'll deal really, as, as my book deals with the former, I'll, I'll focus primarily on the, on the former here. The way sexual identity has become potent and prominent is, is interesting. You know, expressive individualism, this, this Rousseau idea of getting in touch with your inner voice, did not necessarily mean that, that sexual identity would ultimately come to the fore. I think the reason for that is uh, there are a couple of things that lie behind the specific sort of sexual shape of the revolution of the self. One of them is the, the, the intellectual work of Sigmund Freud. Uh, Freud really builds off that kind of Rousseau paradigm that, yeah, you are your inner voice, but guess what? Your inner voice is really dark space of sexual desire. Freud is the man who provides the intellectual framework for understanding our sexual desires as fundamentally constitutive of who we are. We might say that there's always been uh, sexual desire throughout history. The Greeks engaged in heterosexual sex, they engaged in homosexual sex, but they never identified as straight or gay because they never saw their desires, their sexual desires, as fundamentally defining who they are. 
that intellectual move is made with Freud. Question then comes, uh, how does Freud's thinking come to sort of grip the, the popular imagination? Again, there's no simple answer to this. Some of it goes down to the way that Freud and Marx were fused in, in left-wing politics by, by the new left. At a more popular level, I think one, one would have to say, well, one, sexual desire is a very, very powerful part of being a human being. We, we are able to experience sexual desire. We, we continue to mate, if you like, long after the uh, period of fertility is gone. Uh, human beings are maybe one of the only creatures where, where sex is a, is a kind of recreation as well as something that's purely focused on reproduction. It's a very, very powerful part of being a human being. Um, I would say from a Christian perspective, in a fallen world, it's a very attractive part of being a human being from a fallen perspective as well. Uh, it really really does play to, to my appetites and my desires to be satisfied. Uh, when you throw into the mix then the development of contraceptive technology that really allows for a very easy separation of sex and responsibility, uh, when you throw into the mix the advent of internet pornography, which supercharges the separation of, of sex and any kind of relationship at all, uh, the idea that we are fundamentally sexual beings and our identity is wrapped up in our sexual desires that's both very plausible and i think from a fallen human being perspective a very desirable option as well so the sexual revolution i mean it has it has many many roots but i think it really resonates very deeply with the pathologies with the instincts of fallen human beings in the technological culture in which we find ourselves today then you can throw in the, the sort of the final magic political ingredient and that is the role of victimhood and marginalization in the last 50 60 years politics in the west has really come to focus upon the victims and the marginalized uh, aids made middle class gay men victims the lgbtq people have always been marginalized they become if I can put it this way, they become very sympathetic figures in the political culture in which we now find ourselves. So a whole host of things come together to make sexual identity politics profoundly influential in the cultural moment in which we find ourselves. One of your pop culture observations is about the film The 40-Year-Old Virgin, which is self-evidently a comedy because in our time to reach 40 without being sexually active is indicative of a failed life, you write. An Australian theologian recently referred to celibate Christian witness as a genuine threat to the cultural zeitgeist of sex as identity. He said that single people's lives of sufficiency and joy in Christ would demonstrate the idol of sex to be nothing more than a worthless piece of wood. What are your thoughts on this? I think theologically that is correct. I do think that uh, the, the idea celebrate, I, I would actually expand that and say chaste Christianity, because I think chaste ca captures both the celibate single Christian and the, uh, the faithful monogamous married couple. I think chaste Christianity is a powerful witness to the world around. Whether the world wishes to listen, of course, is, is another matter. But it always fascinates me that in the, you know, you get these interviews in the newspapers sometimes with uh, very sexually active people, swingers, those kind of, kind of people. They always tend to be people with an upper age limit of around about 50, I would say, just as a sort of a, a rule of thumb. Uh, the sexual revolution has yet to, to run its course in terms of the, the terrible human carnage of the later years when a lot of people will be dying old and alone because they failed to establish these faithful monogamous relationships or will be dying old and frustrated because that which they built their life around sexual gratification is no longer a viable option for them so i do think that the the best witness the church can have to the sexual revolution is a biblical social and sexual sexual ethic acted out socially uh, for the world to see. So yeah, I have a lot of sympathy with, with that statement. You touched on Sigmund Freud earlier, although he gave a credibility and focus to sexuality 
as core to human identity and purpose, uh, the question remains as to how those ideas came to dominate our political narratives today. Can you explain how this connection was forged in the sexual revolution mm. of the 60s and the part that was played by thinkers like Reich and Marcuse? Yeah, that's a huge, uh, huge question, of course, and a, a couple of strands come together there. Uh, first of all, uh, Reich and Marcuse, these are, these are broadly Marxist thinkers operating really from the 1930s onwards. And Marxism in the 30s has a problem. And the problem is that the working class don't seem to be getting the point that they should rise up in revolution against their bourgeois oppressors. If anything, they are doing the opposite. They're marching in droves to support very authoritarian regimes, such as those of the National Socialists in, in Germany or the fascists uh, in Italy. And Reich and Marcuse are interested in, particularly Reich, but they're interested in, in why is it that the working classes are you know, marching in lockstep to the beat of a very right-wing authoritarian drum. What do we need to do to get the, the psychology, the self-consciousness of the working classes in the right place where they will rise up in revolution? Economic oppression isn't going to do it. Well, Reich has the insight that actually what's happening is it's it's – they're being trained, the working classes are being trained to follow the authoritarian leader by the nuclear family, by the church, and ultimately the, you know, as adults in, in the state. The, the, the dominant father figure in the family brings up the kids to respect the dominant father figure. And when they grow up to be adults, they're looking for that dominant father figure, the Führer or Il Duce. And of course, what Reich sees at the heart of the, of the authority of the family are its sexual codes. That's what parents really do. Parents are training their children to direct their sexual drives in the right direction, to repress them, to direct them in the right direction. And so Reich's Marxism takes this interesting psychological sexual turn where Reich says, you know, the way to political revolution really comes through sexual revolution. What we need to do is smash the authority of the nuclear family. And the way we do that is by getting the government to break the sexual morality, the bourgeois sexual morality that's being imposed upon working class families. Uh, that means allowing, you know, put it bluntly, that means allowing kids to give free reign to their sexual desires. That's the way to make them realize that the dominant father figure is not necessary. And that is the way that will stop them marching off to, to fascism. In some ways, it's, it was kind of inevitable after Freud made sexual desire central to human personhood. The person is always a political creature. We're always operating within a social context. So politics was bound to get sexual at some point after Freud. Well, what Reich is talking about in the 1930s and Marcuse is talking about in the 1950s really comes to fruition in the 1960s, uh, 1968, the student rebellions, where the notion of disrupting the established bourgeois social, moral, political order is identified with in-your-face shattering of the bourgeois established sexual order. So that's the sort of the, the narrative. And, and we've moved well beyond the kind of self-consciously Marxist roots of that sexual revolution now. But that idea that personal freedom, political freedom, inevitably requires high levels of sexual freedom uh, is very dominant in Western politics. It goes to the heart of the abortion debate. It goes to the heart of the LGBTQ debate. It goes to the heart of questions say, in America as to whether employers, uh, Christian employers, should provide contraceptive coverage for their employees. That notion that my private sexual behavior is actually of very, very significant public political importance, developed in Reich, explodes in the 60s, continues in a kind of post-Marxist form today. A perplexing development for many people is how everything now has become politicized. Seemingly no domain is exempted from the intrusion of the state, particularly as it relates to human rights. You attribute this to Karl Marx's abolition of pre-political institutions. Can you take us through what this means? Well, well, Marx, Marx is, is insight 
was that, or his, his idea was that all human relationships are ultimately economic relations. Everything we do ultimately fits into a more, uh, an economic scheme that is sort of justifying the status quo, if you like. But what that essentially does is if all human relationships ultimately have some kind of economic significance or economic grounding, it, it actually makes all human relationships political in some way because they're all feeding into this system of either economic injustice, as Marx would have seen, the, the bourgeois situation of the, uh, the 19th century, or, uh, or, or, or political justice, as he, as he dreamed of in the workers' paradise to come. Uh, and that idea has, has sort of come to grip the popular imagination. Again, like the sexual revolution, you don't need to be a card-carrying Freudian or Marxist to have had your thinking shaped by this. Once you start to think of all organizations as somehow playing into the, let's do the postmodern twist here, paying into the, the discourses of power, the power structures of society, then everything becomes political the boy scouts becomes political the church cake stand becomes political everything is feeding into these discourses of power that serve to keep some people in positions of authority while marginalizing others now one obvious answer to that coming from sort of traditional conservative people would be, well, we don't buy the fact that the Boy Scouts is political. We don't buy the fact that the Women's Institute is a political organization. But here's the rub. If only one group in society think the Boy Scouts is political and decide to fight on the Boy Scouts as political as, as a political ground, everybody has to do it. If one group in society decides, hey, we need women in the Boy Scouts, or hey, we need uh, uh, inclusive scout leadership, we need gay or transgender people as scout leaders, then traditional conservative people have no choice but to engage that argument at the political or judicial level at which it's being played out. So as, as groups have arisen for whom that idea that everything plays into a discourse of power, the problem is that everybody then has to play that game. Nobody has the, the luxury of saying, well, actually, the nuclear family is, is pre-political. No, it isn't. Not if people are wanting to pass legislation relative to the nature, makeup, power of parental authority. A refrain in your book is your anticipation of objections, like claims that selfishness, sexual obsession, culture wars, and so on, have always been part of human history. Can you speak to why these objections miss the mark? Yes. I, um, I mean, the sexual revolution, it would be an obvious one. A lot of Christians say, well, you know, Christians of all, uh, people have always committed adultery. People have always uh, engaged in homosexual acts. People have always uh, indulged in, in sort of what Freud would call polymorphous perversity. I think the difference today on that front is that but these things are now central to our identity. Yes, people have always done these things, but now they regard them as central to who they are in a way that has been unprecedented in history. So the idea that, that mere sinful human actions have gone on throughout history, uh, that's, yeah, that's a truism, if you like. What's different now is that certain of those actions have become central to who we think we are, and that changes the game entirely. You know, 30 years ago, say 100 years ago, a Christian talking to a, a, a gay man might have said, you know, I, I, I hate the sin, but I love you. Know, I love you as a sinner. Uh, and that might have worked then because the, 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 the man engaging in homosexual acts might have said, well, yeah, that makes kind of sense. You know, I'm, I, I engage in these things that are wrong, but you still like me as a person. Now, that's not an option because the gay person will not make that conceptual distinction between their acts, their desires and who they actually are. As a, as a person. So it changes the game for Christians. And this is why it's important to grasp the nature of modern selfhood, because in our apologetic endeavors and in our political engagement, we need to understand what we're up against in order to address it correctly, appropriately, and plausibly.
You refer to university life and free speech, writing the transformation of the humanities into disciplines by which the past is not so much examined as a source of wisdom, but rejected as a tale of oppression is key to this anti-cultural impulse. How connected in your view is the issue of free speech with freedom of religion? I think they're both intimately connected. Uh, one might almost say that freedom of religion is, is, is kind of a subset or, or heavily overlaps with, with freedom of speech. And of course, freedom of speech uh, is, in, in many ways, it's an enlightenment concept. I mean, one of the things I don't want to do, uh, it, it come across as doing in, in, in this is bashing everything the enlightenment did as bad. I think Rousseau had some good ideas, the idea of universal human dignity, for example. And, and freedom of speech and freedom of religion really emerge in the Enlightenment, particularly in the American experiment, the founding of America, the First Amendment to the Constitution, which guarantees freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of religious exercise. It's very important. Uh, but they, they operate in a certain kind of society. Uh, Thomas Jefferson famously said, you know, what does it matter if my neighbor believes in one God or 20 gods? It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Think about that. It, it neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. It does me no harm, he's saying there, whether my neighbor believes in one God or 20 gods. And, and most of us would sort of say, well, yeah, amen to that. That, that seems to be the case. I, I lived in Nottingham in the UK. Many of the people in, 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 in the surrounding neighborhoods were Hindus. Uh, it didn't do me any harm to, to be living around Hindus. Well, but now think about the present. Think about the kind of selfhood we have today. Uh, Jefferson lived in a world where uh, he really thought about harm and oppression in, we might say, economic ways. As long as his body was unharmed and his money was safe from thieves, he was not being oppressed. Today, of course, we've expanded that to include language. Why have we done that? Because we think of ourselves psychologically. There's been a, a big debate here in the last couple of weeks after a, a Hollywood actor uh, transitioned from being a, a woman to being a man. And there's been this big debate about dead naming, the use of this actor's previous name to refer to, to the actor. Uh, now they've transitioned. Well, dead naming is interesting. You read the language surrounding dead naming. It's, it's wrong to use somebody's name before they've transitioned because it's, it's harmful to them. It does damage to them. Well, one might turn around and say, well, it neither picks their pocket nor breaks their leg. But yeah, but it, it psychologically harms them because we think of our well-being now in psychological terms. If you take this psychological identity and these controversies about dead naming, etc., and you parley them back into issues of religious freedom and freedom of speech, think about it. For Jefferson, freedom of speech was a social virtue. Freedom of religion was a social virtue. They defuse social tensions. They allowed ideas to compete, we might say, harmlessly in the public square. Once you live in a world where harm is understood in a deeply psychological way, words become weapons. The way to hurt somebody is to use a racial epithet or uh, a derogatory uh, identity term or a dead name. If you think of harm in psychological terms, freedom of speech and freedom of religion, they become part of the problem, not part of the solution. They become cover for people committing, to use the, the trendy parlance, for people committing acts of violence due to their bigotry. There's a tendency in conservative circles to sort of poo-poo uh, the idea of words as violence. And, you know, I, I'm not unsympathetic to that. But think about it. If, if you construct yourself in a primarily psychological way, then the damage done to you is going to be primarily psychological. And the way to do that is not to hit you over the head with a big stick. It's to use a word or a phrase or a sentence that denies your identity or ridicules your identity. So freedom of speech and freedom of religion, I think, are facing potentially very difficult political waters, given this shift in the notion of human selfhood that has taken place. I want to quote from your book again. It is also important to note that the sexualizing of children and the politicizing of sex sets the stage for a struggle between parental rights and those of the state. 
Education and socialization are to be marked not by the cultivation of traditional sexual interdicts and taboos, but rather by the abolition of such and the enabling of pansexual expression even among children. This is timely as several conversion therapy bills have recently been introduced in Australia. One even goes as far to potentially criminalize prayer regardless of any consent given and also parents who seek religious counselling for their children. Should Australians believe their legislators still care about balancing rights to include religious freedom? I'm not familiar with those pieces of legislation, but I would say if, and I've no reason to doubt that you're giving me an accurate account there, Rowan, if that's the case, then yeah, I think the Australians should be very worried about the level of care for religious freedom there is. Uh, I think we're we're in a situation now in the West where, as I said, religious freedom is going to be increasingly seen as part of the problem. And of course, as less and less people actually are religious, I think we can expect that section of society that's growing, of, of the nons, of the non-religious people, at best, they're not going to care particularly about protecting religious freedom if they're not positively hostile to it. So I think, yeah, that's there's a real danger here and 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 as you point out from that quotation in my book sexual ethics and the sexuality of children is going to be the the point of the spear for driving this one because if if children are sexualized and sex is fundamental to who they are then any attempt by the parents to impose their views of sexuality on the child uh, is going to be seen as guess what a form of child abuse and lead to uh, as, as has happened already in the West, lead to the taking of children away from their parents for simply for teaching their kids sexual morality that 30 years ago would not have raised an eyebrow anywhere, indeed would have been regarded as part of a proper parental responsibility at that time. In Australia, we don't as yet have a Bill of Rights, which has so far somewhat avoided our courts being accused of judicial activism. Having said that, how are recent legal precedents out of the United States instructive to other Western nations about the willingness of courts to accommodate religious freedom? Uh, I think the signs in the United States go both ways. The court, the, the Supreme Court has, has moved in a conservative direction due to the appointments that the, uh, I was going to say the previous president, but that's still under question at the moment. I think he's going to be the previous president, but, uh, but who knows, under President Trump, who, as I speak, is technically speaking the present president, uh, due to his court appointees, we've seen a, a conservative shift in the Supreme Court and uh, more tendency towards protection of religious freedoms. So interestingly enough, the, the, the big case on the Christian cake baker baking for refusing to bake for a gay wedding, uh, bake a, a wedding cake for a gay wedding, though that went in the direction of the cake baker, it was actually decided on the grounds of artistic freedom not religious freedom. So it was a win for religious freedom, but not a, not a particularly decisive one. More worrying is the recent judgment in the, the case early this year in, in the so-called Bostock case, which was about uh, uh, transgender rights in the workplace. Ironically there, Justice Gorsuch, who is typically a conservative on the Supreme Court, uh, voted with uh, the liberal wing of the Supreme Court. And although it was offered as a very narrow reading, protecting transgender rights in, in the workplace as transgender people, not just as people, but as transgender people, it's hard to see that a, a narrow reading, uh, a narrow application of the law to the workplace is where that precedent will set, uh, stand, will, will remain. Now that transgender identity is officially recognized in, in one legal precedent, it will inevitably bring pressure on other legal precedents, including those touching on religious freedom. I, I think at another level, uh, in a more general way, I, I also think that part of the problem in the United States is the way that all of these big issues have become passed to the judicial branch. Uh, I do think there's a difference between, say, gay marriage being approved of through a parliamentary assembly, whereby you know, being part of a democracy is you win some, you lose some. The ones you don't like you have to live with because you don't want to live under a tyranny and you hope to win one in the future. And having nine people decide, nine unelected people 
decide the fate of the nation on a key issue. Gay marriage was effectively decided by one man, Justice Anthony Kennedy, the swing vote. And I think that makes politics uh, generally a much more polarized and nasty uh, phenomenon than, than it typically is in democracies. The, the defusing of tension through parties brokering power with each other is really destroyed when everything gets kicked to the judicial branch. It's clear from your book that there is little common ground for fruitful dialogue between people of faith and the culture at large. What insight can you offer on how we can communicate a sincere desire to see religious freedom as a right among other rights, rather than as something motivated by animus? That's a good question. And I think it's very, very hard to do that because the cultural mindset is increasingly uh, that that religious uh, faith is irrational and can therefore only be driven by uh, mental illness or bigotry of some kind. So I have very little hope in the present context that good arguments can be made in the public square. Uh, I think the, the answer long term has to be that Christians need to be as good as citizens as they can be in the, in the nations in which they find themselves, but also be loving and supportive communities that demonstrate to the outer world that they take their faith seriously. Their faith is not about harming and destroying and damaging other people, but their faith is something that, that when acted out in the church in the way that it should be is actually something that, that, that reflects the best kind of human flourishing there can be. So I'm very pessimistic about arguments in the public square uh, based on religious principles and very pessimistic that as less and less people are religious, uh, that we can, we can expect society to continue to think of religious freedom as, a, as an almost unqualified good. But I am hopeful that if the church regroups, if the church accepts its marginal status and does what people on the margins do well, that is form strong, vibrant communities. Uh, that then we, we may be able to make ourselves plausible once again, not in my lifetime, probably not in the lifetime of my children, but maybe at some point in the future. The book is entitled The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Cultural Amnesia, Expressive Individualism and the Road to Sexual Revolution. And it's available for purchase now. Professor Truman, thank you very much indeed for being with us today on Talking Freely. Thanks very much for having me on, Ryan. That's it for our latest episode of Talking Freely. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can do so through our website, www.freedomforfaith.org.au. Freedom for Faith exists through the generous donations of individuals and organisations across Australia. If you'd like to financially partner with us, you can do so through our website.